And, uh, you know, we carried this over because we were having so much fun and we've not even scratched the surface yet. But I know everybody, uh, Wayne, wants to talk about the WWF and your experiences there. We talked about uh, on the experience about you loved working with Randy Savage, even though you were two different people. Um, if, if you care to, who did you not enjoy working with or what were the, the, the things in your career there that, that maybe didn't click? Uh, every time that Jake Roberts would go into rehab... Uh, I, I know Jake is all clean and sober now and everything. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, he says, uh, I guess prescribed Oxycontin makes you clean and sober, but, uh, that's beside the point. Uh, I didn't say, I don't the, give a shit. The, shit. the view, the views of the honky tonk man are not necessarily those of, of your sponsors or hosts, but they may very well be, but you, you okay. know, not necessarily. But, but there, there again, here, here, I, I, I get the intercontinental belt, which catapults me. And, and you know this, Jim, from, from mid-card level status up to semi-main event, main event status. So I finally get that one break I'm looking for after 20 years in the business. Then here, Ricky Steamboat, oh, I wanna, I'm want i leaving and uh, I'm not going to work any return matches. So, okay, he came back, worked a couple return matches, and then he was gone. Now, it was all booked out for him to work these return matches for four or five months. So in the meantime, and you know this in WWE, if the, if a guy leaves or he quits or he's in rehab and he's gone, then we have to have a substitute. Well, now we make it a non-title match. Honky Tonk Man loses every night in the middle of the ring. The only time, and I said this on the other show, the only time I ever won any matches at all was TV matches on TV. Once every three weeks that I was on, I would win. But every house show, I had been beaten time and time again and and, and that that's that's a good point the people don't understand the conventional wisdom in those days was when you substitute an advertised match you don't want to piss the fans off further so you let the baby face go over regardless of what the situation is which meant that you through no fault of your own because the other guy took off were having to do all these jobs because there was a substitute and they were trying to make people happy right and then of course the center con on title it was a non-title match it's a main event it's sold out and here you got the substitute, and he's all, you know, trying to make a name for himself now. Like they bring in Crusher when it was Chicago and, and Milwaukee and Denver and San Francisco. And this guy, I, I, how the Crusher, God bless him, he's not around to defend himself. Uh, how he ever made a nickel in this business, I do not know, but he beat the living shit out of me. Well, he was, 60, he was 65 years old then, and he was practically immobile. And Jack Lanza would stand there with that one-eyed, cocky eye of his with that cigarette in his mouth and say, Hey, how do you get all these old-timers? I said, because these fuckers won't show up and they're all in rehab. <laughs> That's how I got them. But anyway, I, w I would lose every – I lost every night, Jimmy, and here's the thing. Losing is not bad. I'm not complaining about losing. The hardest part of the job was to go on television then every week and convince the people that I'm still – the champion and I'm the greatest of all time and I can't be beat. And even though they saw me get my ass whipped <laughs> every night. Well, they say heels are supposed to lie. So you were lying. <laughs> yes, I was lying. And I was, I tell you what, I was good at it. Uh, now, now that I became not honest, I couldn't get a job anywhere. You know, I get fired. <laughs> so, uh, like WCW, I guess. Well, speaking of which, I, I would, should we go there? Anything else about your WWF tenure that just oh, comes up? Oh, you know, there, there's been a lot of misconception about the thing where uh, I, I, I didn't want to drop the belt to Randy Savage on the, on the big show on television. That Randy being – the name Randy Savage, a macho man, had nothing to do with that. And, and Randy and I had talked – we talked about it uh, before it ever happened. And I, and I told him, and he was okay with it because he was a businessman. And he probably he wouldn't have done it the same thing either, uh, in front of and that was one of the biggest uh, uh, television audiences they ever had. Something like 30 million people watched that Saturday night main event. And Vince had always told me, I, my deal with him a handshake deal, and I said just keep me good on TV. If you give me a chance and I sell tickets, pay me. If I don't, if I don't sell tickets, fire me. I'll take my bag and go home. Just keep me good on TV. And he said I will. And then here we come. Now he wants the job flat out finished in the middle well what happens to me you and know, and, ba and and back yeah. then guys and and once again for for today's fans and for the young wrestlers listening today are thinking what are they talking about why would anybody care but it was important 
not necessarily whether you won or lost or who you won or lost to, but the the time, the venue, the place, the, yeah. the, 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 the platform that you were winning or losing on was important, and the professionals. How many jobs did Hulk Hogan do on TV? How many Absolutely. times did John how many times did John Wayne get beat in the movies? <laughs> how many how many times did the movie Absolutely. end where he was doing a job flat of his back? He may have got that you got heat on John Wayne, but Bruce Dern's the only one that ever killed him. Um, and, and, you know, so it was important and, and the people viewed it as such and it determined what kind of money you made because this was before guaranteed contracts where, you know, if you got a sty in your eye and you were home for six months, you could still get paid. This was when you had to go out. It determined your future earnings. Yeah. I I mean, sure. I I, I didn't even have a guarantee to do that job that night. None whatsoever. Nothing. I didn't know what I would have gotten paid. If he said, listen, I'm going to give you $20 million. I want you to get this guy over and get him over strong. Randy would, if I had done that, Randy would never have been world's champion. He'd been intercontinental champion and probably, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, So uh, the whole history of everything, but it, it was, it was my decision to make and mine only because I control my own destiny. And now you, of course, now you just said it. They don't control their destiny. They have no, they, they sign up and they have to, they're, they're only robots, they're puppets, there's no other game in town. Uh, there was a big company called uh, WCW or Turner uh, Wrestling back then, and uh, uh, Jim Barnett was there. And, and Jim Barnett, I called him and told him what was going on, and he advised me to know, and they had a big meeting set up in the Bahamas for me to go to and everything. So, uh, just staying, going back and staying with WWF at that point in time, I don't know. It could have been a mistake for me. It could have been a big mistake because I, I mean, Vince never forgets. Yeah. Well, but at the same time, the fact is you stayed there. What would happen now in 2014? If one of the champions said, no, it's not the right time. I'll do a job. I'll drop the belt, but not in this particular place. It's not right for business. <laughs> Where would their future be? <laughs> oh gosh. Jimmy, you, I mean, but, there, there is no future. You're out of yeah. business. And, you know, I think I don't even know the contract structure anymore, but I'm sure you have to go along with the uh, with the battle plan and, and all those things. But, you know, back then there was no contracts at all. We had to, it was one little page of single space typing and 50 bucks for a TV show. And you got to you were guaranteed 10 TV shows. So it's fifteen hundred dollars. What the fuck? You go beat me in front of 30 million people out here. <laughs> but the fact is, you didn't do that job. You didn't do that job, and you stayed with the company, and you were still used in a feature position <laughs> because you sold tickets. Well, yeah, that's what it was all about, and I couldn't understand it. We, Randy and I were on a, we were on a, uh, had come off a Canadian tour. Every town was turn away crowds. I mean, turn away. And here you're going into this show, and this is what you want. But the thing that bothered me the most was, we'll, we'll reprogram you. How, how the fuck are you going to reprogram me to, to, to do what? Shave my head and come back as a German? <laughs> and, you know, that was the, the art for so many years of being a booker in wrestling uh, uh, was the ability to present what you wanted to the talent, not that was going to win because they loved it regardless, but to the talent that was going to lose. <laughs> you could present it in such a way that they would say, oh, okay, you sodomize me with that rusty fishing knife, and then we'll move on. Well, yeah, and- just, just, I mean, let me do- People said, hey, Honky Tonk Man, you, 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 were, you must have backed into the position for that belt. I sure did. I backed right into it, I guess. But, uh, you know, by the, the thing is this, Jimmy, I, I have no problem any time in my career, but I didn't want to leave the WWE, and, and, and I wanted the WWF. I wanted to stay there, and I, I had a good thing, and I had worked my whole career to be there. That was my dream come true is to, to be in that company on that level. And if you don't want to strive to be at a higher level, get the fuck out of the business. But, but, and as a matter of fact, what year was that? Else, any, but anywhere else I went, when my time was over and I was leaving the territory, I did what was supposed to be done. I did what was supposed, except for the part of the thing we talked about on the other show with, yeah. uh, Jerry, with Jerry Briscoe and, uh, and, and, uh, Buddy Rogers, when Buddy Rogers was booking. They, they were going to shoot on Larry and I, and Larry was uh, panicked and said, we're getting the hell out of here. So we picked up our paycheck, and that, that Wednesday, and they, they said, yeah, you boys are going to make it to Miami. Now, yeah, yeah, we are. Hell, by the time Miami show started, we were down there in Atlanta. 
<laughs> but well, and, and at the same time, in that position that you were in, it wasn't going to do anything for business if you won or lost, or if you were even there, you were going to take a main event position somewhere well, else. So it and, didn't and hurt. You know, that's that's there. what Larry told Jerry on the phone. Larry, I heard Larry. I was standing there, and Larry said, "Jerry, why do you want us on TV now? You haven't used us on TV in four weeks." And Jerry Briscoe said, "Well, it's only the right thing to do now. I'll, I'll work. I'll work with your partner, and 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 uh, you can work with Buddy Rogers. Well, we know Buddy Rogers, what he was doing, and how what how he was, and we know about the Florida office. And Jerry and I are great friends now. We always laugh about it about Jerry Briscoe trying to wanting to shoot on me and wanting to hook me and." <laughs> <laughs> well, what 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 year was it where the, where Barnett had the meeting set up with WCW for you where, uh, uh, on that job thing was because was that eighty nine or was it ninety? Uh, it had to be no. I was I was out of the belt by ninety. So because yes, I, I lost the belt to the Warrior, but this this was had to be in eighty eight eighty nine somewhere. In well, there. I, I believe Jim, I remember Jim, that. I remember Jim, that because Jim. I was. I was on the the booking committee when Flair was booking at that point. Turner had just you, bought the company, and I think yes. I remember him having that meeting scheduled and then it falling through because you decided to I was going to gonna meet. That, I was going to meet with uh, Jim Barnett, Jimmy Crockett, and Jim Hurd. Yeah, the the meeting was set up to for us to go there, and Jim Barnett told me he says next time you call the office. Uh, make sure that you use your real name. Because I had called her and I said, this is Honky Tonk Man calling for Jim Barnett. Because, see, Jim knew that there was moles in the office and there might be moles answering the phone. Because Jim, Jim had abruptly... Well, then, what, 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 what moron... Well, I started to say, what moron wouldn't know your real name? But then again, in the, when I was working in the WWF office in 1996, one of the secretaries gave me a message when I came back from lunch and said, a Harvey Race called for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, but yes, but there, there again, now Jim had, Jim had, uh, abruptly left WWF back then and had gone back down for Turner and for Crockett's and them guys. And, uh, and, and I had, you know, I'd not worked for Jim a lot, just a few, a uh, few shows here and there, but he knew of me. He knew of my whole, his, he was another historian very much like you. So, I mean, I could pick the phone up and call him. And, and and that was important, and that's what I did. And he said, well, the next time you call me, use your real name, because he knew that none of those secretaries would know who the hell I was. Yeah, and then it wasn't long after that that Jim Hurd fucked Tully Blanchard yeah. and Arn Anderson on their deal with, that Flair had made for them to come from WWF back to WCW. But, of course, Tully, not caring because he was leaving, uh, got a failing grade, shall we say, on the periodic drug test, and Heard would not honor his commitment to hire him based on that, and fucked Arn out of an extra hundred grand that he had promised him because, well, I'm not getting both Tully and Arn, so Arn isn't worth as much by himself. So no WWF talent came to WCW for the next five years after that until Heard was long gone and Bischoff had got him to open up the checkbook. Uh, yeah, that was true, and you know. Uh... Rick Rude did go in for, I think, for Jim Hurd, and uh, or, or one of those guys, or maybe shortly after that. that was, I think me, that was I think that was Francis Ford Kippola, Kip Fry. Yeah, that's so, uh, yeah, that's who it was. Yes, yep. yeah, that guy. But anyway, uh, Rick had told me about his deal down there, and he says, "You know, I went in. I said, well, I'd like to have Y class tickets." They said, "Sure, okay," and I'd like to have this. They said, "Sure, okay." He said. Damn, I fucked myself. I should have said first class. They would have signed off on it. Oh yeah, that's. <laughs> he said. He said, man, they're signing on everything. So I'm thinking, why did I let Jimmy Hart tell me? Listen, don't do this, man. Call Vince <laughs> first. Call him and tell him. Call him and tell him. Do not leave. Don't take the bell. Oh, I said, man. And Root's telling me all this, and I said, boy, did I really fuck myself. Well, that's that's why when Kip Fry took over, Bill Watts uh, nicknamed him Francis Ford Kippola because he was just giving away this. He was giving guys performance bonuses to show up for work. Yeah. If you yes. it had a guaranteed contract, but if you showed up for the pay per view and actually had a had a match on the pay per view, you got a bonus on top of that. And he, he gave away the right. store, that and and him. they they ended up losing millions and millions of dollars under him, and then that's when. Bischoff stepped in and said, "Hey, I served a second course at the Last Supper. I can get you out of this." Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and the, that the, became the, the meat man, the guy that drove around in a pickup truck selling frozen meats out of the back of the truck. Eric Bischoff. You know, I gave I gave him. Let's that talk. Name, let's Bischoff. talk. Let's talk about Eric Bischoff. What do you think about Eric Bischoff? <laughs> uh, I don't think about that prick at all. I tell you what, if he was laying on the roadside and he was dying of thirst and needed a drink of water, I wouldn't piss in his mouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> actually, actually, if he was dying of starvation, I wouldn't defecate in his mouth. <laughs> how did you? How did you? You finally you went down there for a little while, right? Or did you? Very, I've, very. You know, Jimmy, I was there, and for all the fans, and I tell them, they said, "What was that song you had in WCW?" I said, "I wasn't there long enough to learn the words." <laughs> How did that come about? Uh, it was one of those things where, uh, once again, J J Jimmy Hart uh, orchestrated this whole deal because Hogan was going in, and Hogan wanted, you know, some friends around him that that that, that Hogan could trust and knew that if we were there doing the setup work and the prep work and getting the matches over, it would be better for him and make him a bigger star. Which you know, that's normal Hoganism. Which is uh, that's his deal. Well, that's know, that's been every, every top guy in the business since Strangler Lewis has had that mo. Well, well yes, and and of course, you know, if you're a booker and you got four or five of your buddies that you know that can go out there and get the job done, of course you're going to bring those guys in, and and that was the situation. And when I went there, the first meeting with Eric Bischoff, uh, I got a call first from Ric Flair and uh, Jesse Ventura was on the line. And he did, Jesse did the setup call, you know, hey, man, how you doing, blah, 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 you need to come down here and be with us and that old bullshit, that old buddy stuff. And then Flair's on the phone, yeah, can you send us a taper and come down so we can uh, maybe get an audition on you? I said, audition? What the fuck? You've known me for 15 years, man. I need to audition. <laughs> Hell, you don't, you don't audition a guy you already know. So anyway, they brought me in, and the first day there, uh, Bischoff walks up, I introduce myself, and he says, I was never, I was never a fan of your character. I didn't like it at all. But Jimmy Hart has been on me and on me, and the only way I can shut him up was to bring you in. Well, so that I, that doesn't start out good. And I said, I hope I can change your mind. And I walked away knowing here's the guy giving out contracts. I'm fucked. Yeah. So that lasted for about four months, and then came the uh, put Johnny B. Bad over and. You know, when I said, "Ah, fuck this," I ain't got no. Who, who was? Who was? It was kind of like Johnny B. Bad uh, and you. It was kind of like uh, Motown meets fucking Sun Records. It was uh, yeah, and it was. It, it, you know, he, and, and and guys would come to me. Arn came to me once. He said, "Man, we really appreciate what you're doing for him." I said, "What do you mean?" Oh man, you're going out there. You're having great matches with him and doing just getting him over so good. I said, getting him fucking over. He's on a three hundred thousand dollar year contract. I'm making a thousand a night. I'm out here to help myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talk about the way Bischoff presented himself. The last contract that we signed with WCW, me and the Midnight Express, basically Wahoo McDaniel and Jim Ross and and everybody, all the agents, everybody was on the booking committee. Everybody universally overrode. Jim heard because he hated us, didn't want to sign us, and they voted against him. So he said, okay. And the way he handed me our contracts in a manila envelope, his first words were, you know, I was against this. And, and my reply was, we were too. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I called my wife, you know, and she'd seen me go through these things before with, with different uh, people, which, you know, I had it with Stu one time, him and I had a big falling out and I had it, you know, of course with Vince and, and, you know, you get these divorces, but I, I, I went, I went right away to the payphone. Back then it was payphones fans. I went to the payphone. I called her. I said, I won't be here very long. She said, what now? I said, this fucking guy that signed the contract said, he, he said, I've never been a fan of yours. And the only reason you're here is because I, Jimmy Hart would not leave me alone. So but, but you know the 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 thing with Bischoff was he he spent money like a drunken sailor, but it was all with guys that he wanted to hang out with. He liked to yeah. go to Sturgis and ride the motorcycles, and he wanted yeah. to be known. I, I understand I got incredible heat with him one time when I made the comment because I've never been around the guy very much. We had a few brief meetings, but I I said you know Eric Bischoff is as phony as his hair, teeth, tan, and talent because his hair's dyed, his teeth are capped. Uh, his tan is is sprayed on, and his talent has been fictitious because he he tripped over uh, an, an invasion angle that he saw in Japan and was able to convince the Turner Broadcasting people because he wasn't a wrestling guy, which became more apparent as time went on. He wasn't a wrestling guy, so he was able to finally convince them that he was a TV guy like them and they should listen to him, and they opened up the checkbook. He signed a bunch of stars that somebody else made, and it's almost impossible to to make an invasion angle fail, almost, not completely, as we've seen several times. So, But then once that he got that accidental angle, 
He was not able to keep up with it. He wasn't able to follow up on it. And he put them in a position where they were paying not only the talent so much money that they had to sell out every night forever to make money, but also that he'd, they'd put so much in the TV because his whole goal was beating Vince McMahon's ratings. That, But the time they spent the money on the TV and the time they spent the money on the talent, they could never suffer a dip in business. They could never do anything but sell out every night forever or they'd go in the hole. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? They didn't sell out every night for the rest of their lives. They went in the hole and they lost 60 million bucks. And there you go. And Bischoff is the one who laid the groundwork for that. So sooner or later, folks, a blind squirrel will find a fucking nut. And he accidentally, he was successful for two and a half years. Yeah, my, my, my close personal friend, and, and you know him very well, and probably one of the premier trainers, and uh, uh, they talk about a great mind in the business, not a Jake Roberts. It's, uh, his mind is all hazed up from years of crack pipe, but uh, Hustler Rip Rogers. Uh, <laughs> yes, it, yes. Uh, Hustler, uh, I love reading his tweets and stuff. He's so honest and everything. He, he came to me because he was there bringing talent in from uh, – from Louisville and different places, and and would drive them in. He came to me once. He said, they're, 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 "They told you you're getting a TV uh, a title." I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, the tape you just worked on, you didn't have the belt, right?" I said, "No." He said, "That tape is showing two weeks after you should have had the belt." I said, "Oh." So I go to Flair, and Flair says, "Oh, we'll take care of that in post production." And and Rip smartened me up. He said, "There's no way to take care of it in post production. You don't have the belt." There could have computer generated onto your waist. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so that was the end of uh, of my thing. And then the next week in Nashville, uh, uh, they came to me with a finish, and uh, they had some country music star out there and said, "He's going to bother you during the match and uh, get your attention, and you slip on a banana peel, and Johnny B. Bad's going to roll you up." I said, "Uh, uh-uh. uh, I did a Gordon Soley. Uh, uh-uh, uh, not tonight." <laughs> Oh, and, and I, I gotta, I gotta bring this up. Ninety six, you were back in the WWF for a little while with, with your most important. Oh, don't even, uh, don't even remind me of that shit. The most important position, and I was not a fan that's, of this. That's worse than being WCW. I, find my I, protege after a fucking six months. You can't find anybody. I was on the creative team. Don't blame me for any of this. I wasn't a fan of any of it. But you went on a search for a protege. And came up with Rockabilly, Billy Gunn. Yeah, at a guy's the, at doing the time, jobs every fucking night. He's getting beat every fucking night. And this is a guy you're going to use for Christ's sake. You can't find a new guy. Well, at at the time, the only people, the only person that Billy Gunn could beat was Road Dog, and the only person that Road Dog could beat was Billy Gunn. They were jerking the curtain against each other every they night. They were losing. They were yeah. They were losing. The, I asked Billy. I go to him. I said, "Who are you working with out here on the road?" Because I didn't know. He said, "I'm working with Flash Funk." I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm doing a job every night." You're doing a job for Flash Funk, and you're going to be the next guy after six fucking months of me? I can't f- – holy fuck, this thing was dead from the get-go. Well, I and, and I tried to make the statement to him, but it wasn't taken at the time. But I said, you can't – you can't put a gimmick with a gimmick. He, basically, they, they thought that somehow Rockabilly was going to be the next generation of your gimmick, and instead what it did was it made both of y'all gimmicky because you put a gimmick on a gimmick. Yes, and, and you know what? My my thing, Jimmy, and I'm not tooting my own horn, and some of the fans can say, well, I'm an arrogant prick and all this stuff. The thing, the way I dressed and the way that I was over, overshadowed anyone or anybody unless they brought in someone who was – extremely new who had never been seen before and then you could promo them guys in or different Otherwise, or different my, my thing was way too strong it was too strong i overshadowed whoever it would have been you you needed somebody that was that was different not a a, a, a ripoff of the same to me, to be because there had to be some kind of contrast, and what they right. were trying to do was they it was it was like Honky Tonk Man Junior. What were you in, you know in Florida twenty five years ago or whatever when Billy Gunn was born? Somehow you were I don't know. Yeah, but, and, and you and you're right there on contrast, and uh, I, I, I'll smarten the fans up a little bit. When it comes to tag teams or manager wrestler, there has to be a contrast, and you know this. When I was in tag teams, there was always a contrast. There was myself, who I'm, I'm the flamboyant guy out there doing the boogie-woogie bullshit, but Larry Latham, Spot Moon Dog, he was the rough, tough customer in the ring. When I was with Valentine, Rhythm and Blues, 
I call it rhythm and snooze. Uh, but anyway, because Valentine was always sleeping. But there was a contrast. Here I am. I'm the guy that goes in. I take all the goofy bumps. I do all the bullshit with a flashy suit. Then when it comes time to get somebody get the hell beat out of them, Valentine's in there throwing those hammers around. R- Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson. Ricky was was the the short, blonde haired underdog that sold, and Robert was the tall, dark haired guy that was bigger and made the comeback. Yeah, the only absolutely. time you, the only time you could find money tag teams that there wasn't a contrast was when you were talking about identical masked guys or identical twins. Otherwise, right. there had to be contrast. Ray Stevens and Nick Bockwinkle. We could go on. Um, but so that that but, but one, if you had if you had the medics that looked alike or the interns, they always had Doctor Ken Ramey. There was <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had, and they had a manager. It was completely different, and also they could switch. They could switch places, so you could get that or, out or, of. Them. Or they had Las Vegas Louis. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who we just who we just saw in in as a matter of fact Lexington at the comic convention. Yeah, but uh, you know that's you know that's the thing, and I know you guys had these creative meetings and everything, but. The problem with the rockabilly thing was not Billy at all, and Billy blames me for all this, and he, he will go to his grave doing it. And, and to be in a position where he is now wearing a coat and tie and pushing a pencil up there, uh, it's you know he, he shouldn't have that attitude. But people get attitudes with a coat and tie, and they carry attitudes over from their past lives. I knew after this thing went more than three or four weeks, it was like every week on TV here. I'm still looking. I'm it's six fucking months now. I'm still looking for Christ's sakes. It, it, it was dead right there from, from that part, Jim, it was dead from the, I'm looking, I'm still looking. I'm still, lo- yes, I'm still looking. <laughs> well, it, 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 and actually it was, it was nobody's fault because they, once again, they gimmick to gimmick. They also took a guy that had been been beat like a drum, and and tried to suddenly p- foist him into a position. And then you know, but at the same time, they were wonderful evaluations of talent. Because you know, I'm a big fan of the Armstrong family, and I kept saying, well, you know, Road Dog is is worth something. But like I said, he he was on the Heat crew too. The Buttermilk Run, as the Dream Machine used to say. So the only ones they could beat was each other until they decided to do something with both of them. And, and then the tag team, as all great tag teams and all great things in wrestling, the tag team was 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 not even planned to be a, a top team. It just they got together and, and it worked and they went with it. Same thing yeah, as Austin it, it, 316. It, 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 they yeah. didn't plan that. The people yeah. brought the sign and they went with it. And they never dreamed this kid. And I said it from the very beginning, the first time I saw the kid. This kid, the rock, and you know they were doing Rocky, Rocky, Rocky sucks, all this background noise and shit. I knew right away this kid had the same. He had what Hogan had. He had the looks. He could talk. He could wrestle. He had. He appealed to all people around the world, whites, blacks, Hispanics, Chinese. When you got someone that can appeal to that and can – the guy could carry the load – they didn't have to do that rocky bullshit stuff. They should have started pushing this kid right away. Well, yeah, but see, that's the thing. That's they did start pushing him right. They just pushed him down people's throats because I saw his tryout in Corpus Christi. I was there that night, and I went to Vince, and I said, "Whatever you do with this kid, plan with music, with look, whatever. Plan that he's going to be your champion in five years because he's that good, and he made it in three. But." The first thing they did was the the between the haircut and the Rocky Maivia, uh, and yes, I know it was a nod to his father and grandfather, but it, the 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 outfit I don't know where that at. Creative Services was on acid with the tassels <laughs> and well, whatever, most, and, and and he had a chia pet head, and the chia pet head, and then they began shoving him like nobody's business. And I didn't mean when I said he'll be your world champion in five years, I didn't mean keep him undefeated from his very first match. There was a backlash because people could tell. And Pat Patterson's done a wonderful job with a lot of guys, but he he went too whole hog on that, uh, too fast. And there was a backlash because the people could tell that he was being pushed down their throats without ever having earned it or deserved it. And his his talent was being masked by all of the 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 crap that was hanging off of him but at least he was able to use that fan backlash when they just threw their hands up and said okay you know well well then get mad about it and the die rocky die became his motivation to become himself and get over we knew it was under there it was just it was covered up by a lot of fucking bells and whistles at the start and and finally that was stripped away and and he was able to to do what he could do and that's what got him over it's amazing, and and then, and then and then Vince Russo took credit for it. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's amazing how the the that company, the WWE, can they can repackage people. They really can, and they can take years to do it and make them very successful. Whereas other companies have never ever been able to repackage someone and make them from a non-star to a big star. But what what do you think about this part of the way that people used to be uh, before the term even became repackaged in wrestling was, and I've said this on the program a bunch of times, you never really, unless you were a hometown hero from the start, you never got over in your home territory. They saw you when you were green, when you were a rookie, when you were breaking in, and and just because they shoved you into a main event didn't mean that the people took you seriously, with very few exceptions. You always had to go away, go somewhere else, where where the people weren't so critical of you because they hadn't seen you from the start, get your shit together, and then come back to your home territory as a more complete package. And that's the way that, you know, even Lawler. Lawler started out wrestling the first match in, in the Coliseum in Memphis, but he went to Alabama, and he went to Mississippi, and he met up with Jim White and Sam Bass, and it took a couple of years. Then he comes back, and he's a he's the hometown star in Memphis. And, uh, you know, the, the same things happened with every – hometown hero but now unfortunately there's no place to go you're seen no national television from the time that that you're you're debuted out of the, the developmental program and the only place to go is home so now when they want to repackage somebody they have to rely on fans short memories if the guy changes his hairstyle or maybe it just doesn't work because we've already that was the guy we saw six weeks ago he was somebody else which destroys his credibility how is it, is it going to be harder and harder to repackage guys now because the only place for them to go is home? I, you know, I don't know how they're able to do it and send the guys, uh, away. And, and, uh, I mean, look at Kane for Christ's sakes, they've repackaged him and total different looks, total different, everything. And th- the guy's still over, but he's still Kane. He's not coming back as a different name. Well, but uh, remember, remember now, uh, Isaac Yankum didn't get over, and the fake Diesel didn't get over. But then they put the mask on him, and that was a whole different. But that was brand new. That wasn't that wasn't a, a stupid gimmick like an evil dentist. Which Vince called me up in Knoxville and said, "Oh, you're going to love what we've done with Glenn Jacobs." And I saw the evil dentist as if Vince must have gone to the dentist that day. <laughs> and then the fake Diesel was. He, they were trying to to you know it, it, they were asking a guy to do the impossible to to redo somebody that had been a big time personality for him and just rip off the gimmick completely including the names that wasn't going to work but then finally Kane was something that was not only brand new that hadn't been done before but they covered up his face so you couldn't see it was that same guy that they were trying to foist off on us as a dentist and a fake fucking Kevin Nash and that worked because then Glenn was allowed to be himself as Kane yeah they they've been they're masterful at doing that whereas uh, other wrestling companies could never, ever send someone away, bring them back three months, six months later, same body type, same facial expressions, but call them something else. I, I, I don't know how they're able to do it, but it's the power of their television. And uh, their, the TV that WWE has is so powerful that they can make you in one night or they can break you in one night. And then, of course, uh, one of the more, more remarkable repackaging jobs in the history of wrestling, Sugar Bear Harris never drew a dime, but Kamala was a main event monster, wasn't he? Well, did, you I, ever, I, did, did you ever see Sugar Bear Harris wrestle? No, no, I, I never knew him as Sugar Bear. I mean, I, I, I always called him that, and he would just laugh, you know, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, but it, uh, no, watching, the, the watching Kamala Sugar- thing was, the Kamala thing was, uh, it was, and it was done very. It was done so good. I mean, it was done. Uh, and you can't. I mean, when you throw in King Curtis doing the interviews, and uh, uh, it, it was a beautiful piece of work. Well, and and even before that, when when they painted him up in Jerry Jarrett's backyard, when they when they first gave him the gimmick, because Jerry's whole thing was watching Sugar Bear Harris wrestle, and and I love Ooga Booga Man. I call it, but it, 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 Kamala was a great attraction. But watching Sugar Bear Harris wrestle was more painful than a root canal. 
Well, and and Jerry Jarrett came up with the idea. He said it, basically all reports when he when he booked Sugar Bear Harris, all the reports from everybody he trusted were that this is the worst wrestler we've ever seen. So he came up with a gimmick where the whole gimmick of the guy was that he doesn't know how to wrestle. He's a Ugandan savage from the jungle, and they painted him up and made him that. And he he was a main event player from the first time he stepped in the ring as Kamala. It, it was the amazing. Only, the, the the only thing I missed was. Uh, 300-pound Buddy Wayne, the original Buddy Wayne, dressed as Kim Chi. Yeah. Oh, that was a sight to behold. I didn't know they had that much camouflage in the state of Tennessee as when, when he was dressed up in that outfit and, and the beekeeper's mask and everything, so nobody knew it was him. Because you couldn't have Kamala the Ugandan Giant drive up to the building in a car driving because he's a Ugandan Giant, so he had to have a driver and a handler to go. Those are the little details that Jerry Jarrett would fill in and we talked about before that, that people wouldn't even think of, but when they'd see it, they'd know something was wrong. How's this well, guy from yeah, Uganda got a driver's license? Well, you know, Abdullah, the butcher, he couldn't ever talk or anything in all his interviews, but you see him in the airport, you see him down the street, and he had all his gold and stuff on. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, gosh. How, how, now, let me ask you, because I know you're up on these subjects, and I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm an outsider looking in. This Roddy Piper, these at least. Now, I've had these little Internet feuds going with different people at different times, but this one seems to be like they want to bitch slap each other and stuff. Well, they've made up already. Oh, Did you hear about now? this now? Yes. No. See you get now. See you enlighten me. I told you you were up on this stuff. I'm not. Uh, apparently, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you've heard about it because if you're if you're listening to this program, you're up on all the internet happenings. But apparently, Roddy Piper. On his podcast, which, of course, doesn't get the ratings that ours does, but, you know, but he tries. He's a good young man. Um, well, he, won't call me, he won't call me to be on the show, and I wouldn't be on it anyway, so that's okay. Well, see, his, his ratings would go up. But anyway, apparently Roddy Piper told a story about when he kicked Kevin Nash out of a locker room in WCW years ago, and then Nash took it very to heart that it actually happened the other way that he slapped Roddy and knocked him to the ground and, and kicked him out or whatever. And Nash uh, was up at four o'clock in the morning. And I, I gotta be honest with you. I have a great cult of Cornette following on Twitter. I have a bunch of followers and, and I, I listen to them and I, I respond to them, but I'm not at four o'clock in the morning. That's not the only thing that I'm thinking about in my life is what's being happening on Twitter. But Nash got on Twitter and Twittered a bunch of shit about Roddy and called him a cunt and a piece of shit and blah, blah, blah. And then somehow uh, they, they, they both and, and wanted to be on his podcast, set the record straight, and then somehow they both spoke to each other. And within a day or two of Nash calling him a cunt, Nash was apologizing. He, he's a legend, and we've, we've talked and settled this out all straight. And, and Roddy's talking nice about Nash. And... I don't know, but if somebody calls me a cunt in public, it's going to take me more than 24 to 48 hours to get over it. Uh, but well, apparently they, I, they've made up now. I don't know. Well, you'd have to ask the lady there. Alice, what do you think about that? I mean, if somebody was saying dirty things like that, could you just call them up and say, I'm so sorry? Number one, I'm hoping I don't, I'm not sounding like a robot. Do I sound okay? No, you're good. And, and to, to explain that to the people, <laughs> Alice occasionally has trouble with her Skype where she suddenly sounds like uh, the robot on Lost in Space. But go it's ahead, a, Alice. Pain in the ass. But, I, I was actually awake uh, having one of my bouts of insomnia when I saw this particular Twitter thing happen. Uh, it was about, I don't know, one in the morning uh, here in Los Angeles. And it's just one of those things. It's like, dude, it's it's he, he's nearly sixty, and it's like four o'clock in the morning. What the fuck? Um, yeah, if somebody called me a cunt, yeah, it would it take about a week if I if I had think, to put if I had to weigh that out on a scale. Do you uh, think it depends alcohol, on who's saying it, though? Do you think alcohol was involved for a for a grown man to be on Twitter at four o'clock in the morning calling people names because they they had the wrong story or possibly the story you didn't like about a locker room skirmish? Well, if he's anything like my mom, it just could be that, that you know, he's an older person, and, and uh, God damn it, I'm talking to two older people. I can't say that. Yeah, I was um, going to say, you know, I've, <laughs> I've, I mean, Roddy, Roddy has always, uh, Roddy's always been a different kind of guy, but Roddy at the same time is pretty much the last time I talked to him last October was the same as he's been for the last 20 years. I think he can find his way home, and I, I just look at it like this. it's two guys. One guy was a, a, a great promo and a great performer who drew a lot of money, and uh, always protected the business. And another guy was a guy who made a lot of money for himself and exposed the business in a public forum. Um, 
and and they had a disagreement and you know uh, what, what the hell who knows only only uh they know the true story of whether they've made up was it all a work are we going to see kevin nash versus roddy piper on pay-per-view coming up we don't know <laughs> i hope Jim, not Jim, I, I hate uh, to be and, uncool and, but Jim, i don't want and, and alice let me uh I, I can say this from uh being some going on 37 years now in may will be uh if you don't have a really really tough skin and you can't take harsh criticism from everyone this is not the business to be in uh <laughs> that's just how i mean listen you can't take anything personal because it's not personal unless they are attacking or saying something or exposing something about your family that's going to cause you personal harm physical harm or your family personal and physical harm then you know and of course jimmy you know this from years and years gone by well, and, and I, was, I was about to say families, I wish... families are off limits unless if it's if it's hogan and hogan's daughters in the wrestling business and carrie von eric's daughters if they get into the wrestling business now it's it's all bets are off then family is if family is off limits, except if they're also in the business, and that's what yeah. one time one time when I called Vince Russo up and, and cussed him out because I do I have taken things personally in the past, and and to get away from that, I chose to get away from the fucking people that drive me crazy in the wrestling business. But Vince Russo accused me one time of 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 threatening his family and saying bad things about his family when actually what I said was I said besides the fact that his Howl at the Moon kids were very misbehaved, the only time that I ever fucking met him over at Bruce Pritchard's house. And they were shooting everybody with a water hose. I said his fucking wife must be a saint to live in the same house with that fucking cretin. And that's the way I threatened his family. So anyway, there you go. There you have that. Well, there, there is times when you do when you do take things a little bit more personal than you should, and and uh, then you know at four o'clock in the morning, a couple glasses of wine, a few beers, uh, things start to come out. The old truth serum starts to surface and. And you're not one of those because I know you're not. You don't. You don't do any of that kind of a after hours nonsense. You never have. I always which, do it right, right it? during the day, right out in front of everybody. I throw my bullshit right out in front of everybody, where everybody can yeah, see absolutely. it. Absolutely. I don't know what that Mountain Dew or whatever that stuff is you drink does to you, but uh, <laughs> holy Christ, man! I, I've always said, listen, if you want the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, call Jim Cornette. Well, you know, here the thing that I'll, I'll say this: the the. The thing that I, has always made me the most mad at people and the most lingering mad at people is not only when they do shit, when they either lie to me or about me or they fuck with my business, but also when they fuck with the wrestling business that I and a lot of other people have tried to make money in and they fuck with that, that's when I get fucking mad and I take things personally. But it's generally, I mean, I've had people cuss me out on over personal things and, and hugged them and kissed them on the cheek you know, a day or two later, but about the wrestling business, I have, have always taken that seriously because it was responsible for me and a lot of other people making a lot of money and having a lot of fun. And I hate when people try to fuck with it. That's, that's the way I feel too. And that's the only time I get, uh, you know, that little, uh, stone in my shoe is when, uh, you're trying to, or someone is trying to, you know, cause me difficulty in my, my ability to make a living. And that is, not where we, we can call each other assholes, motherfuckers, cocksuckers every day, all day long, and you hear that all day long. But to tell another promoter, don't book this guy or don't do this, he's a prick, he's an asshole, I would never do that to anyone. I don't care who someone books. I don't care who Vince pushes. I could tell Vince McMahon, hey, uh, I don't think this is a guy for the job, but if that's the one you want to do, I'm all game. You know, when he told me Ultimate Warrior, I looked at him with my eye popped, you know, with my uh, my people's eyebrow that I had long before the people's eyebrow, and I went, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, you know, and that's, it's it's the same thing with, with with me and Vince Russo and Paul Heyman. Everybody thinks, you know, Paul. Everybody thought me and and Paul E hated each other even before we did. I always say, but the thing is. I've never called Paul Heyman names in public besides a liar because I wouldn't believe him if his tongue was notarized. But <laughs> You mean he's but, like Dusty Rhodes? Well, it, oh, he makes Dusty look like Mother Teresa. But the thing is, Paul is, is a great promo. Paul's a great wrestling mind. Paul, I didn't like the style of wrestling that he presented because it got a lot of people hurt and it numbed people to the 
to the uh, angles that we used to do that could draw money, but that's a story right. for another day because the point is Paul's been a success and Paul has done a very good job at a lot of different things in the business. Vince Russo couldn't book Lassie in a fucking pet shop and he's a miserable human being personally and I've told people that. So there's an element of respect that keeps me from calling Paul Heyman names on a personal basis that I have no problem calling Vince Russo those names because he's all those things and more and he's a piece of shit and he's ruined the wrestling business. So there well, you go. There's two different things. If you have respect right. For somebody, there, there's there, there's two there's you know. two different kind there's two different kinds of pricks in this business. There there's a personal prick and there's a prick just that's in the business. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have problem working with pricks from business. I just have problem working with personal pricks. The boy, that's a lot of peas. I hope I'm not popping my peas uh, there. But uh, you know, we could Jimmy, do this all day, and okay. we almost have. But let, let me end with this, Jimmy, because sure. I I, I kind of gave you a little tease on it with the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, it, People, you know, I was asking, uh, I've been asked to do interviews and stuff, and I, I don't do them anymore. I've done, this is your podcast I did for you. It's the only one I've done since I did the Coke Cabana. Uh, I stopped doing those because I have no axe to grind anymore. I have no shoot interviews anymore with anybody because all the kids out there now, they're all good kids. It was their fathers or grandfathers that were the assholes and pricks to me. <laughs> so, uh, but to the ultimate warrior, I have to say this, it, it's, People have asked me. My neighbor asked last night, "How would they, such a? How did you feel?" I, well, I wasn't shocked. I wasn't surprised. What? 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 The thing that touches me the most is, it's a young family that now will grow up without a father. Very much like the Owen Hart situation. Now that was a yeah. shock to me because it was a tragic, tragic accident. But with these other guys that I find out that you know tomorrow or tonight, if they call and say so and so has passed away. That's not a surprise. It's not a shock. It's just part of our our, our industry, our business. Uh, it's the, the the that young family now that will go on the rest of their life without a father. That's the sad part of it. It's it's a tragedy, but it's not a surprise. There's a no. difference. You're not yeah. surprised with some of these things, and and even and you know we talked about Warrior on on the experience last week, in that. Um, you know, I never had much interplay with him. Didn't wasn't around him that much. I, I always looked at him as the 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 uh, torch bearer for sports entertainment, style over substance, look over ability. And I don't mean to say that bad because I I looked back and he did draw a ton of money. Vince got him over, even though he ha he had a charisma and he was in the right place at the right time. But he was the furthest thing from a good wrestler, and and he was not the easiest person in the world to work with or deal with, from what I understand. But it's not a surprise because even he said to people, from what I understand, you know, I guess all this shit that I did will cut years off my life. And, you know, if you're just an, an, a normal adult human being, you have to realize that doing shit like that and looking like that, it cannot be healthy for you. And, and you know, I look, I, I've told the story about when Lex Luger was riding with me in the Midnight Express, Bobby and Stan Lane one day, and I was driving the rental car and we were on the way to Atlanta TV and... I'm eating a Wendy's triple cheeseburger with extra mayo and the grease is dripping down my elbow. And he's looking at me like I'm, I've got steaming turds in my mouth. And, you know, I said, I said, when's the last time you had a cheeseburger package? He's like, oh, I had some French fries about six months ago. He deprived himself of all of that food, ate clean, worked out religiously, and did, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff that later on in life. Now I'm in better physical shape, and this is not gloating or not being happy about it because I like Lex. But I'm in better physical shape than he is because all, at least all I was on was cholesterol. And But you, if you're a grown adult man, you've got to know that if you're making those choices and you're doing those things, sooner or later something bad's going to happen to you. I can't imagine why it wouldn't. And, you know, that's what happened with, with Warrior. Uh, yeah, and I, I saw, and I'll end with this, I saw the uh, one time I went to the movies. I don't go very often. My daughter, she was small back then. A uh, young child, she wanted to go see this movie, The Lion King, and I saw this, and the, the whole thing about this movie was the circle of life, and it is really a circle of life, and we're only in this thing for a lottery, and sometimes you win it, and you're gone early, and sometimes you lose it, and you can stay around a lot. Listen, I love losing this uh, life lottery, because uh, I want to be here as long as I can, but we're not guaranteed anything, and... Uh, it doesn't matter what you do uh, to yourself. For God's sakes, we know people that should have been dead 50 years ago, and they're still kicking. Uh, and then there's others that have gone on. But the sad thing is the, the young people, the young children, and the young family left behind. 
Yeah, that exactly. And, and, you know, with, with Owen, people say, well, he shouldn't have been up there. Well, he, you know, he was trying to, to do what, you know, he felt like he needed to do for his job and, uh, you know, and, and shit that shit like that happens. And then you've got, you know, you got kids and you got a wife and you got a family that loses somebody and it's just, you never know. So that's why, uh, I decided as Jerry Jarrett said to me one time, he said, I used to think I hated the wrestling business, but then I discovered once I got out of it that I just hated the people I was in business with in the wrestling business. I deter- that, you I d- know what? That, that pretty much sums it all up. And uh, I, I think we all have a we all have a brotherhood. We all have a com- camaraderie. We all shake hands and hug each other and walk away going, fuck that. He's a fucking <laughs> asshole. But at the end of the day, we're all in the same business. We all have the same scars on the head. We all made the same trips. And that will never change. And why someone thinks, well, my wallet is bigger than yours, so I'm bigger than you. Come on, brother. Hey, brother, that's bullshit. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's why I, I I said everybody in the wrestling business is crazy. It's just is it is do you get in wrestling because you're crazy, or do you get in wrestling and the crazy people in it make you crazy? But everybody ends up crazy. And as a couple of years ago, I just stepped back and said, I'm crazy. Absolutely. I admit, hi, hi, I'm I'm Jim, and I'm crazy, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get get over that, and and I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm much a complete, more peace I'm a complete now. fucking nutcase, and I've been told that a thousand times, and guess what? I don't give a shit. 